HSE Section 1.1 Energy Use and Raw Materials from Fossil Fuels. This section is all about the chemicals that we access from fossil fuels. So we'll start by explaining what fossil fuels are. There are three kinds. First one is coal. This is solid fossil fuels. We've got oil. It's a liquid fossil fuel. And finally, natural gas, which is indeed a gas. Now, all three are basically the same substance. They're hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbon is a chemical that contains only carbon and hydrogen. And fossil fuels, they are differing lengths of chain of hydrocarbons. So short chain hydrocarbons are down here in natural gas, grow into longest chains of coal and oil between. Oil is also known as petroleum. Now that is not to be mistaken for petrol, which is a different thing. We might as well get straight to what petrol is now. So to understand that, we have to first look at what oil is. So oil oil is a mix of mid-chained hydrocarbons. It's also known as petroleum. And out of oil, we can extract various mixes of chains of hydrocarbons. Now, one of those mixes we call colloquially petrol. Uh, the Americans call it gas. Uh, we call it petrol. Now, don't confuse petroleum with petrol. Petrol is a subset of petroleum. It's a product that we create out of petrol, out of petroleum. Now, how do we create uh, the various mixes of chemicals out of oil? Well, we do that by using fractional distillation in equipment that looks like this. So, this is uh, industrial fractional distillation equipment. Hot crude oil is pumped in here at the bottom and various components of the oil are then extracted from the side. The way it works is that the hot products mix around down here, they rise up and they condense at various levels. Anything that condenses between here and here will flow out uh, on this shelf here into the lubricating oils. Anything that condenses here will flow out to the gas oils. Anything that condenses between here will flow out and be collected as kerosene. So this is a physical process. Nothing's being done to change the chemicals themselves, what we're doing is we're taking a big mix of all different chemicals in here and we're using heat and condensation to separate out those chemicals into different groups. The gasoline group is towards the top. The only thing that's lighter than that are light gases like butane and propane which are captured out of the very top. So that's the fractional distillation process. Remember that it's a physical process, not a chemical process. The chemicals aren't changed, they're just sorted by this process. The constituents, uh, in particular of gasoline or petrol, are of particular interest in the HSC. So it's important that you know that petrol is a mix of mid chained alkanes. So it's alkanes, that's a word we're going to come up against a lot in this course. And an alkane is just a saturated hydrocarbon. So what that means is that, let's say we've got pentane here, uh, it's got five carbons connected to each other and then 
it's saturated with hydrogen, which means it's got as many hydrogens as it could possibly have for the number of carbons. In this case, what that means is that it's got 12. Did I count it correctly? Yep, 12. And no double bonds between any of the carbons. We'll deal with what double bonds do a bit later, but for the moment, it's important to understand that if there was a double bond, that's going to take some of the four available bonds that the carbons can have, which means that they're not going to be able to have as many hydrogens, which means it won't be saturated. Uh, if it has a double bond, then it's an alkene. So if they're all single bonds, that's A. It has one double bond, that's an alkene. And if it has a triple bond, that's an alkyne. That's the nomenclature there. Now, one important alkene is ethene. Let's talk about that for a second. It's not an alkane, it's an alkene. Yeah. Now, it's called ethene or ethylene, two are uh, the same chemical, you can use them interchangeably. And it's got a double bond between the two carbons. So Okay, because it's got a double bond, it's going to only be joining to four carbons. It's a slightly different shape. And this double bond, one of the things it does is it, it makes it more reactive because this double bond can break and then the carbons can each join to a new thing. There's, there's a range of extra reactions that alkenes can go through that alkanes can't. And that makes alkenes very useful. So the first thing we're going to do is look at how we get our hands on ethene as an example of, of an alkene. And then we're going to look at what can be done with ethene because there's a number of reactions that you'll need to know. Now, as I said earlier, fossil fuels are, are mostly alkanes. The vast majority is alkanes, which don't have these double bonds, just single bonds. But if we want ethene, we need to convert some of those alkanes into alkenes, and there is a way that we can do that. The way that we do it is called catalytic cracking. Now, it's called cracking because what the process does is it takes a very well, not necessarily a very, but it takes a, a longer hydrocarbon chain and then it cracks that chain. So it breaks it. And when it breaks it, because this chain only has so much hydrogen available, when you break that chain, you create a deficit of hydrogen. So in this case, this bond uh, doesn't have anywhere to go. Uh, this carbon is left short, and this carbon is also left short. And if you do this under the right conditions, you can induce the formation of a carbon double bond, which is what we want in a lot of situations. So the industrial production of ethene uses a catalytic cracking process. And let's have a look at a typical equation for that. Okay, so let's just look at this top equation here. This is the catalytic cracking of a long chained hydrocarbon, C12H26, and with heat and catalytic cracking process, we convert that to a shorter changed chained hydrocarbon as well as ethene. So this is an alkane, and this is ethene. Now, what does this catalytic cracking involve? It involves heat, which is 
is already mentioned up here, pressure and forcing the substance involved into close proximity with a catalyst. The active constituent of the catalyst is called zeolite. We may well need to know that. It's a zeolite catalyst. is commonly used in catalytic cracking. So with heat and pressure, this substance is forced through a zeolite matrix. Basically, it's forced into a lot of contact with the catalyst with lots of heat and lots of pressure, and that creates the reaction of catalytic cracking, breaking a longer chain into shorter chains and also providing available carbon bonding to create alkenes. Now this process isn't just used to create ethene, although it is important that you understand that it's used for that purpose. It's also important uh, for economic reasons in oil refinery to break down the number of longer chained alkanes into shorter chained alkanes in order to meet market demand for these shorter chained alkanes. For instance, to convert some of the longer chain products out of oil into petrol, which there's a lot more demand than gets produced. So that's how they produce ethene in an industrial context. Let's have a look now at some of the ways that ethene is used and detected. The interesting thing about ethene from a chemical point of view is this double bond. It's highly reactive and what that means is that ethene reacts in certain contexts much more easily uh, than uh, ethane or other alkanes. Uh, let's look at a couple reactions that demonstrate that. This is specifically with ethene but it also goes for other alkenes as well. Let's have a look. Now, the first kind of reaction you need to know about is called an addition reaction. It's called an addition reaction because it involves adding one chemical to the other. In this case, bromium is being, Br2, is being added to the ethene. And what happens when you add this bromine to the ethene? Uh, you can just react them together. This happens spontaneously. It doesn't require any special conditions or anything. Is that the double bond breaks open? This one here, and new bonds are available, and the bromine comes in and takes up those bonds. So you get something that looks like this: uh, two bromines, and Otherwise, it's just got now an ethane structure. It's called 1,2-dibromoethane. So that's an addition reaction. And the addition reaction basic formula also goes for other substances that have an affinity for a carbon bond. So hydrogen and chlorine are two good examples in the same way that the ethene broke open for the bromine, it can break open for hydrogen or chlorine and you'll either get, in the case of chlorine, it would be 1,2-dichloroethane and it would be a kind of special case with the hydrogen because if we substitute hydrogens in here then we've just gone straight back to plain old ethane with the hydrogen. Hydrogen creates ethane, chlorine produces 1,2-dichloroethane. Just move that over so you can see. So that's an addition reaction. And so an addition reaction it always involves an alkene, in this case ethane, and some substance that has an affinity for a carbon bond. Uh, the classic examples are Br2, H2, Cl2, and then that substance is completely absorbed 
into the molecule. Uh, the other example is a mix of these, for instance HBr will be absorbed right in. In that case, one of the molecules will be bromium, one a hydrogen, it'll just be one bromoethane or bromoethane. Or HCl, so that's hydrochloric acid. If you add that to an alkene, it'll be absorbed in a similar way around where the double bond was. Now, there's a, another couple reactions that the double bond is very useful in that we'll come back to shortly. But first, we're going to look at the counterexample to the addition reaction, which is known as a substitution reaction. And it's a little bit different in a very important way. It's this one up here. Uh, we'll get to the full products in a second, but we'll just look at the reactants to begin with. Substitution. Now, I've chosen this example uh, for a very important reason, and that is that this is one of the standard experiments in the HSC, is to add bromine water to cyclohexane. Now, in the presence of UV light, uh, this substitution reaction will occur quite slowly. It will occur, but it won't occur very quickly. Now, what happens is, it doesn't, with an alkane, like cyclohexane or, or any alkane, it doesn't have a double bond to break open and take on the bromine. So instead, if we draw this out, instead of writing it as CH2, each of these CH2s is just a carbon joined to two hydrogens like that. Instead, what happens is that over time, one of the bromines will swap with the hydrogen. So over time, one of these will swap. It only happens with halogen pairs. They will, over time, substitute, which is where the substitution comes from, themselves for one of the hydrogens in the alkane and create a haloalkane. That is what we get. Just looking at the products. So with UV light, this uh, proceeds slowly and we get bromocyclohexane and hydrogen bromide that's acquiescence dissolved in the uh, substance. Now, if we started instead with cyclohexene and bromine water, then it would be, uh, so in that case, that would look like this, have one less hydrogen, that would be an addition reaction. The bromine would just immediately come in and break that bond, and we'd get two bromines, and it would be 1,2-bromocyclohexane, not bromocyclohexane, as the, react as the product. And that would happen very quickly. And so that creates the experiment that you'll need to know for the HSC called the bromine water experiment. The bromine water experiment goes as follows. You use cyclohexane and cyclohexene. Okay, sorry, I'll just write it. This is the bromine water experiment. And the reason you use cyclohexane and cyclohexene instead of, say, ethane and ethene is because both of these are liquids at room temperature, whereas ethane and ethene are both gases. So it's harder to add bromine water to a gas. You can bubble it through, but it doesn't give us the, the quick results we want here. Now, with cyclohexane and cyclohexene, you can add the same substance to them. So both of them are plus dissolved Br2, which is bromine water. Now, bromine water is brown, and then you watch what happens with the cyclohexane. The 
an addition reaction is going to happen and that's going to proceed very slowly. So you won't see an immediate change. But with cyclohexene, the, sorry, with cyclohexene a substitution reaction is going to occur. That's going to, that's going to go very slowly. Cyclohexene, it's an addition reaction. So it's going to be very fast and it's going to very quickly convert all the Br2 uh, it's going to absorb it, essentially it's going to react with it and so it's going to discolor the bromine water, it's going to go from brown to clear and so adding bromine water is a way of telling whether you've got an alkane or an alkene alkane or alkene so that's the bromine water experiment. Now we're going to look at the way that an addition reaction can be used to create very, very large molecules. The first one we're going to look at is the production of polyethylene from ethene. Now, remember from earlier that ethene is also known as ethylene. So to say polyethylene is just to say many poly ethylenes uh, and as is suggested by that name the, the chemical polyethylene consists of thousands of the molecule ethene joined together now in this, uh, in this diagram I've got the polyethylene with these dots there's a unit right here and then these dots what that means is that it just repeats over and over again. In this case it repeats thousands and thousands of times. And the way that this works is that the process is, uh, is started where the ethene's double bond breaks. And that means that these carbons, because carbons can have four bonds each, they now have an extra bond available. And instead of joining on to something else like with the normal addition reaction, what they do is they join on to another one of these ethenes. And then that ethene has its own bonds broken and the process continues on. So this process is known as polymerization and ethene converting to polyethylene is an addition polymerization reaction. So it's an addition reaction, and it's an addition reaction that leads to the production of a polymer. So it's an addition polymerization reaction. They're called polymerization reactions because they create polymers. A polymer is simply a molecule that is composed of many poly examples of a monomer. So in this case, ethene is the monomer to polyethylene polymer. Whenever we produce one chemical by repeating thousands of units of a precursor chemical, we call that a polymerization process, and polyethylene is the simplest such molecule because it's simply a very, very long chain of hydrocarbons. It's a straight chain, just carbon and hydrogen. However, there are two different ways to produce polyethylene and they cl complicate the process somewhat. If we want to create a form of polyethylene known as high density polyethylene, we use what is known as the Ziegler Natter process. And what this does is it uses particular catalysts. Are known as titanium chlorides and trialkyl aluminium compounds. Tri aluminium. And what this does is it creates 
a very large number of these long straight chains which then line up very easily next to each other. So just lots of long straight chains, very little cross linking in between them and they sit together and they form a very dense, densely packed polymer. Now the conditions for high density polyethylene, just create some space, add some more so for high density, high density polyethylene, the catalyst are the ones I just talked about. So that's titanium chlorides. And try alkyl aluminium. And the conditions, 60 degrees Celsius and 20 atmospheres of pressure. So pressurized to 20 atmospheres and 60 degrees Celsius temperature main, uh, is maintained. And that creates high density polyethylene. Now, high density polyethylene that's such products as plastic bags and pipes. Uh, plastic bottles is another very common one. The other kind of polyethylene that we produce is known as low density polyethylene, and that uses a different process. It uses a free radical initiator of organic peroxide. Should, uh, should say structure of HDPE is that it's long straight chains that stack together neatly and that's how it gets high density. The conditions for low density polyethylene are 2000 atmospheres, so much more pressure, and 300 degrees Celsius, so much more heat. And along with this organic peroxide initiator, what it does is that instead of building long straight chains, once in a while these will split and the chain will then have a side chain of carbons coming off of it before that changes direction itself. Say it's going. So the structure is actually more complicated where the side chains stop the molecules from stacking together neatly and that creates low density polyethylene. It stacks less molecules into the space so it's got a lower density and that different physical property means it's got different uses it's used, uh, it's a more flexible and pliable plastic, so it's used for some containers, it's used for trays, it's got some other uses as well. So that's polyethylene, uh, high density and low density versions, they both produced different processes. But just to quickly recap, in that case what we did was we took a monomer of ethene, so that was our monomer, put it through a process where we produced a polymer, in this case broke the bond and joined them together. Now there's almost identical process for other monomers, but monomers where instead of having ethene we have some other substance with a double bond. So because it's still got the double bond that can be broken, but can still go through addition polymerization. But what if instead of just having hydrogens here, we had chlorine? I haven't brought that example up for no reason. This is an important substance, it's known as vinyl chloride. 
and we can polymerize it by breaking this bond and joining it together just like with ethylene and we can make a product that is known as polyvinyl chloride so that's that you might have seen it drawn out a bit neater back on the screen before but that repeats thousands of times and this is our polymer polyvinyl chloride also known as PVC you don't need to know too much about how it's produced that's not part of the course but you need to know it's an addition polymerization process and you need to know what polyvinyl chloride is used for uh, there's a much neater version of that equation just here so that's the production of polyvinyl chloride that's the equation there's an initiator used there's special conditions at the end of it we get this unit repeated thousands of times now while we're on a roll and before we talk about the uses of PVC uh, we might as well talk about the final one that you'll need to know for the course which is vinyl benzene so vinyl benzene it's another addition polymer it's very similar to the previous two this double bond here is broken to create a polymer and in exactly the same way this unit then repeats thousands of times this is one of the units here and then it just repeats over and over again it's got this big benzene ring sticking off the side so in this case the precursor the reactant is vinyl benzene and the product is polystyrene vinyl benzene is itself also known as styrene and polystyrene you could also call it polyvinyl benzene as well polystyrene is just the most common name that's used for it all of the polymers are solids at room temperature because of their very long chain that's one of the features the chemical properties of of all organic compounds or carbon chemistry compounds is the longer the chain the higher the boiling point the higher the melting point such that with very long chains you're almost always going to have a solid involved especially at room temperature so that's vinyl benzene and polystyrene we just talked about polyvinyl chloride the question is then well the only thing you need to know is apart from those two equations is what they're used for well PVC can be used for a few different things PVC polyvinyl chloride is it's got certain properties and those properties mean it's got certain uses it's water and flame resistant which makes it a great insulator it's used to insulate various substances it's also used for piping it's used for raincoats you could look up more uses if you want that should see you through the HSC though they ask for uses of PVC it's used for a lot more than that uh, polystyrene on the other hand uh, it's very very good heat and cold insulator so it doesn't transmit heat very very readily which is very useful uh, it's used for packaging especially things that you don't want to be damaged by outside heat of cold it's used for plates and foam cups it can also form of it can also be made into a transparent crystal a very hard transparent crystal this is used for CD cases so that's all the things that we can get 
by using additional polymers and that's the end of section 1.1.